Who are these creatures? And why do they hold such a special place in our lives? Where did they come from? And why are they so mysterious, yet so attractive and appealing to us? What are they really feeling? And what are they really trying to tell us? Cats have historically had a reputation for being the most aloof and least understood of all our pets. What is it that you are lacking? What is that missing component? In a phrase, what you need is to watch this video on cat language, because in fact, your cat can talk to you. Hello, I'm Elliot Haymoth. I've been studying cats for over 12 years now, from the comforts of this laboratory, analyzing the sounds made by wild and domestic cats, to some of the most remote jungles of Southeast Asia and mainland China, studying the ecology and behavior of wild cats. My travels to the small and remote peasant villages of Thailand and mainland China during my scientific expeditions have even given me new insights into the origins of the domestic cats and their relationships with us. It is not disputed here that we humans are the only animal species that has a true spoken language, nor is it implied that cats can talk like we can. However, we also convey additional messages using body postures, hand gestures, facial orientations to add emphasis to our communication channels, in addition to using perfumes and colognes to silently convey a certain message. Combined, these form what we call body language, scent language, and voice language. It is now well known that cats do communicate their feelings, intentions, and desires with other cats, and probably with us as well, using voice, body, and scent language in much the same way as we do. If you are a cat lover, you probably already know, subconsciously at the very least, the fundamentals of cat language. Some people have even reported their cat's communication with them to include psychic and mystical insights. In this video, we will first go back in time millions of years to the remote ancestors of your cats and the very roots of cat behavior. Then, we'll look at the wild cousins of your cats and their way of life. Afterwards, we'll look at why your cat acts and behaves the way it does and what it tries to communicate to other cats and you by way of its body, voice, and scent language. With a better understanding of your cat's needs, wants, and desires through its behavior and various communication channels, it is hoped that future encounters and dialogues will leave both of you feeling much more sympathetic and gracious towards one another. Have you ever wondered why your cat seems so independent and solitary? Or why it likes to play with toy mice? Or maybe why it tears your furniture and drapery to shreds? Or why it eats red meat, tuna, and chicken, yet will eat grass and catnip? As you're probably already aware, your cat is a mammal, the end result of billions of years of evolutionary change. In order to grasp more fully the why of cat behavior and communication, it is most important to understand how these cat-like features evolved and developed, which includes investigating their biological shape and heritage. In order to do this, we must look back over 40 million years to the very first occurrence of cats 
and their evolution. UCLA paleontologist Blair von Valkenberg has been studying the evolution of cats and other carnivores for several years. The first cat-like forms are actually saber-tooths and they appear rather suddenly. We don't see a transition from a dog-like form to a cat-like form in the fossil record. It's just sort of a very rapid appearance of something with an extremely short face, long canines, big incisors, and very few cheek teeth, so, which is typical of cats. It is from this ancestral stock of these earliest of predators that the present-day cats derive. A comparison of all the different types of cats living today shows that although they all evolved a vast array of sizes, shapes, and colors, they are all readily recognizable as cats. The earliest cats appear already with retractile claws, that is claws that are retracted normally when they're walking around and then can be projected when they want to grab prey. Presumably the function of having retractile claws is to maintain their sharpness at all times when you're walking so they don't wear down the same way a dog's claws do and instead can maintain a nice sharpness for apprehending and holding prey. Associated with having retractile claws in these earliest cats are also very muscular forelimbs which will also be used in holding and grappling prey and that in turn is associated with a very short face which allows for an extremely powerful bite. So we see this concert of features in the earliest cats and it's maintained throughout so it clearly seems to be highly adaptive and a kind of optimal um, combination of characters. Short face, strong bite, retractile claws which can grasp and hold prey. What is the significance of this? For one thing, it suggests that cats did not undergo any major evolutionary changes to any of those cat-like features which has characterized this group for so many millions of years. In other words, cats are cats. Some are just bigger than others. Biologically and geographically, cats are amazingly versatile. Throughout their history, they have been able to inhabit virtually all types of habitats throughout most of the world, from the hottest of deserts, to the wettest of tropical jungles, to the barest of rocky mountains. Regardless of size, shape, or habitat, all cats are predatory carnivores feeding mainly on vertebrate mammals. Small cats, like this margay found in South America, feed mainly on rodents, small lizards, birds, and even their eggs. The large cats, such as lions and tigers, feed on large ungulates. And in living cats, we only see groups, really, in the lion at the moment. In general, cats are solitary. They hunt on their own, and there are certain advantages to that. Because if you hunt on your own, you get to eat everything that you kill. You don't have to share it with any sisters or brothers or relatives of any sort. So that's why, presumably, cats are usually solitary, because they can take large prey on their own, and then they don't have to share it with anybody else. The main social groupings of all cats, other than lions, therefore, revolves around the mother and her offspring, with the males entering the female's territory and interacting with the female only at the mating season. Otherwise, both males and females live solitary lives. Because cats are for the most part not a socially gregarious animal, House cats have gained the reputation as being tolerant and even content with their human contact, but always in need of their own independence. Many scientists agree that this African wildcat is most likely the closest relative that gave rise to today's domestic cat breeds. 
while many other scientists argue that at least some cat breeds are derived from this Asiatic leopard cat, Palace's cats, or even Burmese jungle cats. In addition, various recognized breeds of house cats are the result of very recent interbreeding with wild cats and are little more than a few generations removed from the wild. A Bengal cat is a genetic hybrid, a cat between two species, uh, an Asian leopard cat indigenous to Southeast Asia and the domestic tabbies that we know in our homes. Therefore, the scientific name for the domesticated cat, Felis domesticus, is somewhat misleading, as it can be argued quite convincingly that cats are not truly a domesticated breed in exactly the same way that chickens and cows and sheep are. Contrary to popular belief, today's house cats have not changed their fundamental and basic social behavior, nor their physical makeup as a result of their association with humans over the years. In the grand scheme of mammalian evolution and behavior, house cats have undergone only slight behavioral modifications in temperament as a result of the domestication process. This has been accomplished primarily by selecting and breeding cats that have retained their docile, playful, and kitten-like behavior throughout their adult lives. Therefore, much of the behavior of your adult cat is directly derived from its behavior as a kitten. The first record we have of domesticated cats comes from ancient Egypt around 5 to 6,000 BC when cats appeared as temple guardians and honored household guests. This present day Abyssinian cat breed appears to be most closely related to this historical cat. Many people believe them to be the oldest breed of cat that is among the domesticated breeds because um, they resemble the cat that's found in Egyptian sculptures and paintings. Historically, some soldiers, British soldiers in the 18th century, brought them over from Ethiopia, which is modern day Abyssinia, to England, and hence the name Abyssinian. While passing through the peasant villages of mainland China during my scientific and conservation research, I saw firsthand what the most likely reason was for domesticating cats. These villagers would leave scraps of fat, gristle, and meat near their homes in an active attempt to have wild cats frequent the area near their homes and farmlands. They explained to me that rodents and birds that these cats fed on would otherwise raid their crops and transmit a variety of diseases. These wild cats were never kept as pets, but were freely encouraged to associate with humans. It is easy to see both this same scenario thousands of years ago and the evolution of a closer association between cats and humans over the years for mutual companionship. The number and variety of today's house cats is vast. There are white cats, black cats, and practically every color and combination in between. There are cats with long fur, cats with short fur, and cats with wavy fur. There are cats with large ears, cats with curled ears, and cats with folded ears. There are cats with long bushy tails, cats with short skinny tails, and cats with no tails at all. There are cats with reputations for being very active, alert, talkative, and at times mischievous. And there are cats known to be sedate couch potatoes.
It is readily accepted by cat experts and research animal linguists that cats have an enormous vocabulary covering all aspects of their interactions with other cats and their human companions, far too extensive and complicated to cover in detail here. Instead, we will look at three of the sounds most applicable to your cat's communication with you, the purr, the meow, and the hiss. What do all cat owners love most about their pets? The grace of movement? The independence of spirit? The cleanliness? Well, all of these characteristics do have their place. However, the fact remains that the one and only quality which endears any cat to its owner is, of course, the purr. It is that low humming sound that acts as a soothing catharsis that signals to the human owner that the cat is happy, relaxed, content, and loving. It is the purr that we continually attempt to trigger by our loving and caring efforts as cat owners. Let's face it, the purr is universally addicting. It is almost unbelievable that our technological advances and knowledge has allowed us to put men on the moon and send spaceships to other planets. And yet for something as simple as the purr, scientists and biologists still do not know for sure why or even how cats purr. Most of the explanations which have been proposed have been totally lacking in both scientific credibility and any type of hard scientific evidence. It is most obvious that cats purr when they are happy, contented, friendly, inoffensive, submissive, reassuring, and non-hostile, among many other interactive situations. But they will also purr when they are hurt or in pain. The purring behavior appears most likely to have been derived from the mother-kitten relationship. Kittens will purr, possibly letting their mother know that all is well or that they are nursing successfully. While mothers will purr, possibly reassuring the kittens that all is well in addition to possibly acting as a soothing vibrator or even as a homing device for kittens before their eyes are even open. What a cat does to us by its soothing purring may well have the same effect that kittens have on their mother while they purred and vice versa. My own research on how cats purr indicate that the source of the purr is at the epiglottis, a small, flappy structure just below the cat's Adam's apple. Think of the cat's purring as being produced in the equivalent context of when we humans hum or smile, yet produced in a similar way to how we humans snore. By far the most common sound made by your cat is the familiar meow. This is also the most variable of all sounds made. There are short and monotone meows, there are long and whiny sounding meows, and any number of a hundred combinations of duration and intonation differences. However, your cat produces the meow with the same basic message or meaning. It wants attention, or it wants something now. Each individual cat will have a specific meow for each different context. It will meow if it wants to be fed, wants to be petted, wants to be let out, wants to come back inside, wants to sleep in your bed, and anything else it might want. As kittens, your cat learned to make a meow-type sound whenever it either wanted to be nursed by its mother or was in distress. 
Research animal linguist Mona Linda Webb is an expert on cat sounds. So the meowing has been retained as a much more common characteristic of the domestic cat than in the wild cats. Uh, the, this is also what makes a domestic cat domestic as together with the meowing it has also retained kittenish features like wanting to play. The play has, is retained much longer in domestic cats and people can use this by playing with your cat, talking to your cat, you get a much better uh, interaction, much better, better, much better relationship with your cat. When cats are extremely fearful or aggressive, they will produce a hissing sound in conjunction with many facial and body postures. This is most often the case when a cat is confronted by either a strange dog, strange cat, or strange person, in which it feels it cannot simply run away and must hold its ground. Whereas a cat's meow may have hundreds of variations, the hissing sound has no variation at all. It is a clear-cut and no-nonsense display that the cat is highly agitated and is prepared to defend itself with claws and canines if provoked any further. Often associated with the hissing sound is an ominous spitting adding to the cat's overall state of aggression. Scent language, or scent marking, is the physical marking by an animal of its surrounding area. It uses a variety of chemical secretions from scent glands located on various parts of its body. Now, as humans, we are terribly limited to participate in this line of communication. However, because we do spend billions of dollars on perfumes, colognes, lotions, fragrance sprays, we can still appreciate the worth of this behavior as it relates to our pets. Many mammal species, from rodents to primates, have scent glands and scent mark their territories. Mammalian scent in general acts as a scented fingerprint through very small and subtle variations in the mixture and concentration of sexual hormones called pheromones and lactones in the chemical secretions. Each animal has their own individual mixture of pheromones and lactones that is their scent print. When females become sexually receptive, their mixture even changes slightly, which alerts all nearby males of their status. Quite a handy little phenomenon. Cats have scent marking glands located at the base of their urinary tract, which releases their scent whenever they urinate. In addition, cats also scent mark using glands located near their cheek whiskers, known as temporal glands, along their tails, known as caudal glands, and on their lips, known as parial glands. In evolutionary terms, the purpose of scent marking is to advertise the presence of an animal in a given territory with a minimum of risk. Since cats, for the most part, have evolved a highly territorial and solitary lifestyle, using this form of communication is by far the most effective one in serving as a deterrent to other animals of the same sex from coming into an already occupied area, but also serving as an invitation to any animals of the opposite sex who might be tempted to come by for a visit. One of the most common ways that cats spread their scent is when they rub their paws against their cheeks. This action is useful not only in keeping their face clean, but also spreads their scent to other parts of their body and to the front paws, which can then spread the scent to other objects with ease. Everybody who is a cat lover is familiar with the muzzle rubbing of their pet. This is when a cat twists its head to one side and then drags the side of their face across the object. This action provokes a release and secretion of the scent marking chemical. 
Now, when a cat rubs its muzzle against an inanimate object, it essentially lays claim to ownership of that object in its territory. But if the muzzle rubbing is with you or another person, it essentially acts as a form of social bonding and mutual ownership of each other. Because cats have marked their territories with urine and feces for over 40 million years, there are many natural reasons why cats would not choose to use their litter box. Cats spray for a couple of reasons. One reason is to mark territory. If it's a non-neutered cat, male cat will spray to mark its territory. Sometimes female cats as well. Another reason a cat sprays may be because it's stressed. Uh, you change the furniture in the house. The environment changed, and the cat being so dependent on its environment, uh, it may start spraying. Also, it may be as simple as the cat is very clean. The cat is naturally very clean. And if the cat litter box is not cleaned up, this may result in the cat going elsewhere for it to doing its functions. In addition, experts agree that cats would urinate or defecate other parts of the house if another cat is introduced to the house to reinforce their presence in the territory. And another reason might include that the cat litter box is too close to the cat's food. It is most obvious that a cat's sense of smell is much more highly developed and keen than ours is, which is useful not only in identifying individual cats and marking territories, but is also the way they can get intoxicated. Catnip has the distinction of being your cat's intoxicating herb of choice. It is a member of the mint family, and its aroma contains a chemical known as CTN, which drives all felines to ultimate ecstasy, from the 500-pound tiger down to the 5-pound house cat. For reasons still not clearly understood, when a cat smells the catnip, the intoxicating chemical CTN travels quickly from the lungs to the bloodstream to the brain, inducing a cat's equivalent to being stoned. Quickly after the intoxicating aroma takes effect, however, it passes and gives rise to a calming and sedative response. Once cats get into their ecstatic high, many are known to actually eat the leaves of catnip. However, this does not have an added effect intoxicating the cats, as many scientific studies have shown that the chemical CTN extracted from catnip and given to cats by mouth had no intoxicating effect at all. Therefore, experts suggest that the eating of catnip leaves is an effect of the catnip high and not the cause. The immediate and narcotic effect of catnip does demand constraint and moderation in its being given to cats. A little bit at a time, perhaps given as a reward in the training of your cat, would appear to be reasonably safe. As I've discussed earlier, unlike us gregarious and sociable humans, cats are not by nature social creatures. That is, they do not normally tend to associate in large groups. Therefore, cats, for the most part, have not evolved a very large storehouse of body language signals. However, all cats, domestic and wild, do exhibit a variety of ear movements, facial movements, tail movements, body postures, all of which can tell something about their moods or feelings. In addition, the way that cats behave and act are also very predictable. This is because all mammalian displays 
are relatively consistent throughout the entire order. We as mammals can therefore intuitively and almost instinctively recognize the displays and other nonverbal behavior shown by our house cats who are essentially interacting with us as they would another familiar cat. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to get the feeling that this cat is very relaxed and submissive, showing its open belly. At the same time, you equally don't have to be a brain surgeon to know that this cat is just plain mad with his bristling whiskers and facial expression. You can tell a lot about your cat's moods by looking at their eyes. Normally, when there is a great amount of light, the pupils of their eyes contract to vertical slits, while their pupils would open wider in conjunction with a reduction of light. However, cats can change the size of their pupils depending upon their moods. An excited or very happy cat would have its pupils wide open in anticipation of a pleasant event. On the other hand, a cat's pupils would be the same if it were very scared or threatened, in sort of an attempt to gather all light and information about its surroundings. Equally difficult to decode in any simple manner is the vertical slit eyes. Cats will show this kind of pupils when extremely relaxed and at ease. But here again, they will also have vertical slit pupils when very aggressive and about to attack. Essentially, the cat's equivalent to a Clint Eastwood squint just before a gunfight. Perhaps the most important thing to keep in mind then is to look at the context in which your cat makes its display before making your interpretation. Perhaps a better key to your cat's moods is the condition of the eyelids. An alert, excited, nervous, or anxious cat always has fully opened eyes, whereas a cat with half-closed or dreary eyelids is a clear indication that it is totally relaxed and at ease with its companions and surroundings. Active and alert cats always have their ears facing forward, while they would pull them down and back as a submissive or greeting display. But here again, it is important to look at the context, as a mad or angry cat will also tend to pull its ears back as well. Like a dog, you can tell something about the emotional condition of your cat by the way it holds its tail. However, the tail signals of cats and dogs are completely different. Some cat experts have even been able to decode up to 12 different tail positions and corresponding moods. Only the most relevant are covered here. Whereas a dog wags its tail in joy and excitement, cats wag their tails from side to side only when they are irritated or angry or in an aggressive mood, or very anxious. When a cat is relaxed and content with its surroundings, its tail is usually still, or just a tip will move up slightly. A cat's tail is held stiffly vertical, or just slightly bent at the tip when it is in a greeting display, or is very interested in something, like food. It is fascinating to point out here that some cat breeds were developed that don't have any tails at all, or that just have short stubby ones, such as the short-haired Manx, the long-haired Kimrick, and the Japanese Bobtail. Obviously, these cats compensate by showing their emotions and feelings by other means. For many years, people have wondered why their cats have a craving for grass and other greens to supplement their diet, especially if all cats are supposed to be meat-eating predatory carnivores. In many wild cats, parts of the stomach and intestines of their prey are eaten first, containing partly digested grains and plant material while some other cats have even been observed to eat grasses. By all 
biologists have speculated that some plant material in a cat's diet supplies important nutrients and vitamins not found in a meat diet alone. In fact, many zoos and wild cat breeding facilities even feed cooked vegetables to their wild cats with good reason and excellent success. All cat owners are continually amazed at the behavior of their cat licking itself over its entire body for long periods of time. This is a reflection of your cat's desire to keep clean. The first thing that happens to kittens the moment they're born is their mother licks and cleans them. However, since most cats have evolved a solitary lifestyle, there are essentially no mates or partners or peers to mutually groom and keep each other clean. Therefore, cats have developed their own way of keeping clean. In fact, many cat experts agree that the bathing and hygiene requirements in most short-haired cat breeds need little or no attention at all by their human owners. In fact, licking other cats, and other pets as well, are also a way of their cat spreading their scent. It must be pointed out, however, that bored or neglected cats may develop a chronic problem of overlicking and fur pulling from the lack of things to do, which can lead to serious problems if not addressed. On many occasions, when you might be alone and quietly reading, or perhaps even on the telephone, your cat would jump up and rub themselves against you, or meow, or otherwise make a complete nuisance of themselves. This is quite a common and natural behavior, especially from the point of view of the cat. When we sit in a chair reading to the cat, we're sitting there doing absolutely nothing, and the cat probably thinks that, hey, if you do nothing, you could play with me instead. A dog will also, so the cat will come and jump on you when you sit there, when you sit in a chair comfortably reading, uh, quite often the cat will jump you. It is asking for attention, but the reason for it because, is probably because the cat perceives you as being totally weird. You're sitting there doing nothing, so let's play. Now there are some cats that can play the part of the pure couch potato. Quiet, sedate, low-key, and can tolerate petting and human companionship for an almost infinite amount of time without complaint. There are other cats that will tolerate brief amounts of petting and other stimulation before letting their owners know that enough is enough. And still other cats will one moment enjoy being petted, then will suddenly show its owner great aggression, may hiss, and even bite, then run away. Why is this? There appears to be at least two reasons to why your cat would bite the hand that pets it. One cause of this behavior is the buildup of conflict within the cat itself. On the one hand, it enjoys the physical stimulation of the petting. But because cats have normally been solitary animals for millions of years, some are not used to so much stimulation building up inside of them. This results in their suddenly showing that they just can't tolerate any more petting. Another cause relates to a cat's previous experience with other humans who may have mistreated it. Any trauma that an intelligent animal like a cat experiences is not easily forgotten, and the cat may grow wary of anyone who would stroke it. Of course, trust can be reestablished and restored with patience and perseverance. Cats play with many toys and are generally very playful since they've retained their kitten-like behavior. But why is it that they like to play so much with mice? And for outdoor cats, 
people have always wondered why they would catch mice or lizards or other animals and play with it instead of killing it immediately. Once again, the answer lies in the kitten that is inside your adult cat. In the wild, mothers will catch prey live, then bring them to her kittens to introduce the prey to the kittens, teaching them how to hunt and kill prey for themselves as a part of their survival training. So, your adult house cats would play with toy mice as both their ancestors did with real mice as kittens and as their wild cousins still do today. On some occasions, when your cat is in a very relaxed and contented mood, it may lift one paw up and then press it down and repeat the process with both paws. This is called kneading. The cat could be with you on your lap or be on its own on a soft blanket. This behavior is directly related to its behavior as a kitten when it used its front paws to let its mother know it was nursing and content. Some experts even believe that the action of kneading helps mothers to produce milk at the right time. So in essence, your adult cat's kneading is just its reminiscing of its younger years when life was a kinder, gentler era. Scratching behavior in cats is as natural to them as eating or sleeping. Cats have been using the claws of their front paws to survive very successfully for several millions of years. Cats need and use their claws for very important reasons, some of the most important of which are its ability to climb, groom, hunt, clean itself, defend and protect itself, as well as being a form of exercise for the front limbs. One of the greatest challenges to a cat owner today is the destruction to furniture and draperies as a result of this natural and necessary behavior. Many cat owners have recently chosen to simply declaw their cat in an effort to stem this behavior. The issue of declawing a cat has, in fact, evolved into one of the most controversial issues regarding the humane treatment of house cats. However, there are a number of alternative options. You never have to declaw a cat. A simple household nail clipper is all you need to do, and just clipping the tips protects you and your furniture from unneeded destruction. Declawing a cat, whether you keep it inside or outside, leaves the animal somewhat defenseless. Just think what it would be like to have your own fingernails removed. It isn't a pleasant thought, and neither is it for the felines. In addition, scratching posts and acceptable scratching areas should be provided to prevent costly and unwanted damage. However, Many owners still feel that they cannot effectively train their cat to scratch only in specific areas. Nothing could be further from the truth. When your cat scratches up the furniture you just bought for $2,000, this is something that could have been prevented. Cats need to scratch. They have been scratching for 40 million years and they still need to scratch. So you, it's not advisable, it's not wise to teach a cat not to scratch. Instead, teach the cat where to scratch. You buy a scratch post, you buy two or three scratch posts for the cat, make it very attractive. Add catnip, add twisted rope, add toys there, have little feathers hanging in strings from the scratch post, so the scratch post becomes uh, a fun thing. And try to teach the cat to scratch here, not the furniture. If you see your cat clawing the furniture, it's okay to do a little spritz in their direction with a, a, water, a plant mister or a water gun and at the same time yell no. And then the most important part is to do your follow through. 
go over and get them joyfully, joyfully take them to the cat post, and then joyfully toss them on the cat post and praise them. Because if we just stop them, we're frustrating them. You want to let them know what you expect from them. This illustrates just how trainable cats can be if you first understand why and how these very intelligent creatures behave and act the way they do. A common misconception about cats is that they're not trainable while dogs are very trainable. This is not really true as cats are very trainable. Not every cat, but a cat that's been brought up with a lot of interaction with people and who likes treats is very, very trainable. The methods for training cats is all motivational. Make the cat do what you want them to do by reinforcing with a treat or play. Some cats like a little mouse, toy mouse, better than a treat. You can teach a cat to wave, to jump up and retrieve, to go to the toilet in your bathroom, Whatever you want, uh, by training the cat in very small steps with lots of reinforcement. And of course, when you get a kitten, start training at seven weeks. According to the Washington Pet Institute, there are approximately 14 million more people with cats than there are with dogs. That expresses a change in our working class society right now that folks don't have the time with their dogs, to walk them, to bathe them, to constantly be there to take care of a dog, where you don't have to do that as much with a cat. You put your food out for a cat, put the water out for a cat, not milk, water. Many cats are allergic to milk, so generally we water the cat. And you go to work and you come home, make sure there was a litter box for him, and forget about it. You can't do that with a dog. Otherwise, you've got a mess in your apartment or your home. Isaac Newton, perhaps the most famous of all cat lovers, knew best the limitations of his knowledge of cats and science. He once wrote, I feel like a boy playing along the seashore, diverting myself now and then by finding a shinier pebble or prettier seashell while the vast ocean of truth, beauty, and knowledge lay all undiscovered before me. While this program may represent only a few drops in the ocean of cat knowledge, remember that all of the oceans were created by the first few drops. We hope that this program will allow you to have a happier and healthier relationship with your pet. Thank you for joining us. If you would like a written transcript of this program, please send $5 to CSP Productions, P.O. Box 7310, Beverly Hills, California, 90212-7310. Thank you.
Major funding for this program has been provided by WAM International, a pioneering leader throughout the world for the improvement of human communication and understanding.